Okay, hello everybody. This is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, tonight we're continuing in our study of the book of Proverbs, and we're going to pick up tonight uh, in chapter 22, verse 8. Now, if you have not seen the previous studies of the book of Proverbs, uh, from chapter 1, verse 1, we've covered it all, and it's, uh, it's all uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. So I, I hope you will go back and watch it from the beginning. Uh, but tonight we're going with 22, verse 8, and uh, before we get started, uh, Brother Eric, introduce yourself, say hi to everybody. Hello, everybody. It's me again. The hollow mo. Okay. And Brother Luke, why don't you tell them what that means? <laughs> You've never explained it to me. I don't I don't know how you chose that name. Well, but I'm you glad you don't know me at all. <laughs> huh? I'm glad you explain you at least spell it out for everybody so now they know because the way you pronounce it, it sounds like something else. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Uh, I didn't like that part either. Okay. All right, let's get going here. Uh, I'm going to look at this first in the KJV, and then we'll look at it in the Amplified translation, because I use the Amplified kind of like a, uh, a commentary. Uh, Proverbs chapter 22, verse 9, He that hath a bountiful eye shall be blessed, for he giveth of his bread to the poor. Hmm. Well, the, uh, I think the second part of it, uh, uh, you know, is easy to understand, but bountiful eye. I've never heard anything stated like that. What, what, what do you think a bountiful eye is? That's talking about what Jesus said, uh, if thine eye be single. Uh, a bountiful eye is a single eye, and uh, that can only become that way through Christ Jesus. So uh, be singular and be bountiful in our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, you, you brought it up. Now you have to explain to me what a single eye means. Remember Jesus uh, spoke about that. And... Uh, I told uh, Bill what that meant one time. So when he comes on here, he's the keeper of those secrets. Okay, <laughs> back to you. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, I'm going to read it in the Amplified. It says, uh, verse 9, it says, uh, He who is generous will be blessed, for he gives some of his food to the poor. Um, well... Most people, whether you're a Christian or you're a member of some of the various religions of the world, or if, even if you're one of these people that considers themselves a virtuous atheist, uh, the, most people agree that it's, it's the, the right thing to do is to be you know, generous and share. If you've, got, if you've got enough to share, you should share it. Uh, so who can dispute that? Uh, th this verse even says, if we do have that attitude, then we'll be blessed. It gets back to that law of reaping and sowing that we talked about so many times, is that when you do good things, you get blessed. When you do bad things, you get cursed. You get, you know, there's consequences for bad behavior. But uh, uh, generosity, uh, when we talk about giving to the poor, um, Jesus, again, you know, he always takes everything to the extreme to, to really drive home the point. And uh, he, he even talked about how this woman uh, gave a penny. And, and she, he said that she gave more than that rich man that, that, that gave a lot of money. Because the penny was all, the only thing she had was that penny. And so she gave out, out of, out of her, um, from her poverty she gave. Uh, and so uh, to me, the, the point is that there's a lot of multi, multi-billionaires in the world today. And, uh, you know, it seemed like very often on the news, I hear, I just, yesterday, I think, I heard about Mark Zuckerberg, who 
uh, is the owner and originator of, of uh, Facebook. And he's worth about, I don't know, I think he, they said $50 billion, something amazing. And he's agreed to give 99% of his wealth away before he dies. Uh, and a lot of people are really, really impressed. But uh, um, if a person has billions of dollars and they give most of it away, they still have, they still never miss it. And the, the thing that, that Jesus said it was so impressive is when someone gives and it's truly a sacrifice, they're making an actual sacrifice in their giving. If you're giving and you don't even miss it, it doesn't really mean as much as the person that's willing to give, even though it, it actually hurts them a little bit. There's a, there's a personal sacrifice involved. So that's the thought that came to my mind, brother. What do you want to say about that verse? Uh, well, I love that verse very much. Uh, because of what you said and what I told you. Because that's also can uh, be compared to the gospel of Jesus Christ and those that uh, share the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, to the poor. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is good news to the poor. Okay, back to you. Yeah, I would also say that uh, a lot of people... Uh, myself included, uh, I, I'm not, I don't think anybody's going to call me rich in terms of having, uh, you know, a, a lot of money. Like, I'm not a millionaire or a multimillionaire by any means. <clears throat> and I've got enough to pay my bills and have a little left. But uh, I, I'm rich in the world standards because the house I live in is beautiful. I have a nice car. I have pretty much everything I want. I've, life is very comfortable and I don't stress or worry. Or I don't lack anything that I want or need really. Uh, and if you compare me to people all over the world, there are still people around the world today that are starving and they are pushing over a, 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 a tree stump to try to find some termites underneath it to, to, to eat. That's how poor they are. So uh, in that way, I certainly am very rich, but uh, there's a lot of people that, here in America that, you know, they, are, they have enough to get by, but they don't have a lot of extra. Uh, so maybe giving for them is not so easy or so or there's not much to give, but there's more than one way to give, brother. I mean, giving of one's time, I think, is a great thing to give, too. Uh, giving... Um, it, rather than just giving money or materially helping people, sometimes uh, offering someone friendship, sacrificing some time out of your schedule, some time out of your life to give your time. See, to me, the most valuable thing in the world is time. A person, if you spend your money, you can always go out and earn more money. But time is... Uh, perishable it's not non replenishable in other words the time that I've talked to you right now it lasts eight minutes it's done it's gone I can't retrieve it I can't ever get it back I can't get more than my allotted time it's so uh, uh, since it's finite at least until we get into eternity in this life our time the number of day uh, years and days and minutes that we have is finite and once we've used up some we can't get it back so to me the most valuable thing that i have is time and if i'm going to give my time away uh i, I consider that very very valuable and so i i'm hoping that's how i see it and i'm hoping if you're watching this and you're thinking about giving maybe maybe you can give something some of your time to somebody. Uh, all right, brother. Before we go on, what's your thoughts on that? That's very commendable, brother Luke. Thank you very much. 
I appreciate that so much. I'd like to hear from others too. Uh, uh, okay, back to you. All right. Now I'm going to go on to verse 10. In the KJV, it says, Cast out the scorner, and contention shall go out. Yea, strife and reproach shall cease. This kind of reminds me of what we are talking about before we went live about fellowship and uh, and friendships. And, and it, give, it's, it relates also to the idea of who do you give your time to. Uh, I, I have interacted with probably thousands of people on YouTube over the years. And in, in di directly in my evangelism and ministry work, I've, I've, I've probably spoken to more than a million people. I'm not saying this to, to try to build myself or anything. I'm just telling you the, the history of, of, uh, of how I've spent some of my time. Uh, but I, I came to the conclusion that uh, when Jesus said, don't cast your pearls to the swine, that that's a that's a, a principle that he taught that I, I take to heart. And I believe that if someone wants to dialogue with me about the Bible, um, you know, I the scripture tells me to be ready with an answer. And uh, I should be willing to defend the faith. Yeah, but if if, if I discern that they're one of these people Jesus was talking about, they're the swine. The swine, I think Jesus meant, he said, these are the people who have no ears to hear. Then they're not really there talking to you because they want to hear it and consider it, and but they just want to argue and they're not really listening. Now, we've all encountered people like that. And so what I do is I, I try to discern, is this person really here for a real conversation, a real dialogue, or are they here just to argue and try to win an argument? And if I discern that they're they're the swine, then I, I no longer cast the pearls to them. And one way I test this is usually if they'll ask me a theological question, I'll say, well, I, I, I made a video about that. I, I, it just directly answers your question. And uh, or I have a playlist that, that covers that subject very thoroughly. You know, we spent 10 hours explaining it. So I'm going to send you the link to it. And after you watch it, then get back to me and I will discuss it further. Now, if they are willing to watch it and really listen to it and then get back to me, then that proves to me that this is a person that is seeking and that uh, they're not just there to try to win an argument. And so as long as they, that I see that the dialogue could be productive and it's not a waste of my time, remember the time is the most valuable thing I, I own, um, I don't want it wasted. So uh, I don't remember what the verse was uh, that made me think about that. Let me see. It's cast out the scorner. Okay. We're talking about fellowship and friendship. Uh, yeah, brother, uh, we should forgive everybody. Even if someone doesn't come to me and ask me for forgiveness, I want to forgive them anyway, be, if not for their sake, but for mine. Because, because if, if you hold on to anger and unforgiveness, there's a saying, um, being unforgiving is like eating poison and expecting the other person to die. So it's, it's really bad for your health physically and spiritually to hold on to anger, resentments, grudges, unforgiveness. So we, we should forgive. But once we've forgiven someone, does that mean that we are obligated to have them in the fellowship? What if there's somebody like this person here in verse 10? It says, cast out the scorner, and contention shall go out. Yea, strife and reproach shall cease. I think that's an example that uh, when I was talking to you earlier about you can't always remain friends and have fellowship with some people. Even though you forgive them, we're not obligated to have be, try to have friendships and fellowship with, with people uh, if they are the type of people that are going to be disruptive and bring, be scornful and bring in strife. All right, brother, your answer to that. Uh, I love your uh, doctrines. Uh, 
that you've developed. They're so wise. I highly recommend them to all the brethren. And do not prescribe to any of my doctrines, which I am about to espouse to you now. As far as casting your pearls before swine, uh, I do it all the time because I love uh, pig wrestling. And uh, as far as uh, casting out the scorner, well, I kind of like them little scorners. <laughs> and I keep them in my backyard in a pen. And uh, I'm trying to train them to do what's right. Okay, back to you. All right, brother. Uh, I'm going to read that verse 10 in the Amplified now. It says, drive out the scoffer and contention will go away. Even strife and dishonor will cease. Um, it's like right now, if, if, if we, you know, we're, we're trying to study the scriptures. We're studying. We want to learn. We want other people to learn who are, who are watching the video. We want to have fellowship. And yet if someone was here participating now and they are being disruptive and causing things to just not work properly, uh, you know, there are justifiable reasons for saying D depart. It says drive, it says here, drive them out. Okay, I'm going to go on to the next verse. Um, it says in verse 11 in the KJV, He that loveth pureness of heart, for the grace of his lips, the king shall be his friend. All right, brother. Want to explain that one to me? Uh, that's one of those you just got to let it soak in for five or ten minutes before you can respond to it. <laughs> okay, get back to me in five minutes. Okay, well, maybe we don't have to wait. I'll look at it in the Amplified. Verse 11, maybe it'll help us. He who loves purity of heart and whose speech is gracious will have the king as his friend. Um. Not only the king, uh, I'm not a king, but I'll be your friend. If that's the kind of person you are, I, I, I want you in my life. And this is, this is really two verses that are diametrically opposed. The first person, the scorner, you don't want him to be around. The second person is someone you love to be around. Even the king wants to be their friend. All right, brother, I'll go on unless you want to add to that. Interestingly enough, uh, the first one is 10 representing the law, and the, the next one is 11 representing the two make one. Okay, back to you. Okay, verse 12 in the KJV. The eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge, and he overthroweth the words of the transgressor. All right, brother. Do you know, understand uh, foreign languages? You want to interpret that one for me? <laughs> well, you know, I very well could, brother Luke, interpret it for you. Uh, it just uh, doesn't come. Uh, I'm not a machine. <laughs> Okay, I need to think about these things. All right, I'll read it in the Amplified. This, 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 one of the things about this, uh, this book here, uh, probably 95 to 99% of all the verses and words in the Bible, I don't have too much of a difficult time understanding it. Uh, uh, in the KJV, even though, you know, I speak modern English and this is kind of an ancient form of English that is not really the way we talk today. And therefore it doesn't, we don't understand it as easily. Uh, but it is understandable for the most part. And yet, as we go through the book of Proverbs, it seems like it's just packed with verses where the KJV is like, it sounds like a foreign language. And so I'm, I'm thankful in these cases. Uh, if you're watching this now and you're a KJV onlyist, and I was a KJV onlyist for 25 years, uh, 
I was staunch KJV only. I, um, uh, I read 40 books of Dr. Peter Ruckman, who's the, the king of KJV only. And uh, I know all the reasons to be KJV only. And I, I believed that position. I taught it. I defended it. And then I eventually came to a conclusion that, hey, it's wise to look at commentaries and other translations and, and, and try to help get help from other people to understand versus not rely only on looking at the KJV. So I moved from KJV only to KJV firstist. And, uh, but a lot of times when I read it, I think that, uh, wait a second, I just don't get this. And I find it helpful to look at some other translation. And so in the book of Proverbs, it seems to be true more than any other ch chapter uh, in any other book in the Bible that there's a lot of verses that the way it's written is just a complete puzzle to me. I'll read this in the Amplified and let's see if it helps us at all. It says, uh, the eyes of the Lord keep guard over knowledge and the one who has it, he overthrows the words of the treacherous. All right, brother, I still, even in the Amplified, I, I still don't claim to be able to understand what it's what it's trying to tell me. Okay. Oh, I understand it perfectly, Brother Luke. Uh, and a wise man will draw it out of me. Okay, back to you. All right, I'll go on to the next verse then. It says, uh, verse 13, I think I can understand this one. <laughs> it says, the, the slothful man saith, there is a lion without. I shall be slain in the streets. <laughs> man. Oh, man. That is an amazing example of laziness, isn't it? Uh, of course, slothful is another word for lazy. Uh, so it says the lazy man says, there's a lion outside. Uh, I'm going to be killed. I'll be slain in the street. Uh, in other words, he's too lazy to even come up with a plan or some kind of action to avoid death from the lion. That's what I think it means. What, what do you say, brother? <laughs> it sounds to me like it's setting the bar for laziness, doesn't it? <laughs> Let me look at that in the Amplified uh, 13. The lazy one manufactures excuses and says... There is a lion outside. I will be killed in the streets if I go out to work. <laughs> oh, now I get it. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, now it's even funnier because he's using the lion. He's making the excuse for, to not go to work. <laughs> oh, man. Did you find that as funny as I did? Uh, well, absolutely, Brother Luke. What I don't understand is why uh, we don't get more uh, hilarity out of the scriptures because it's obviously in there. Okay, back to you. Yeah, well, you saw, I don't, I, the, this last minute, you were, if you watched me and listened to me carefully, you heard me laugh out loud. And laughing out loud is one of the great things that we can do i was watching a tv show last night that, or no this morning and it made me laugh out loud a couple of times and i called my my sister up and then i called my son up to tell him about it because i said hey i, I was just laughing out loud and uh because it, it really is such a wonderful thing to be able to smile and laugh. It, it is really, it is good for our health and good for our souls um, to be able to laugh and smile. Even, I, I read a, a study that was done um, where scientists said that when people smile, they, uh, the brain activity causes endomorphins to be uh, secreted and and those endomorphins is what made people happy uh, 
and that happens whether you have a, a real smile because like you're just happy and you're smiling or even if you you just say hey uh brother raise the corners of your mouth up like this it doesn't even have to be a real smile it's just that what happens is when the corners of our mouth move up these muscles come up and lift your mouth up like that that it causes uh, something to happen in your brain thinking you're smiling and it shoots off endomorphins and you get happy so um a lot of the things that we do are just natural things that happen through uh, electrical responses and chemical reactions in our brain i found out uh, recently that uh, some of my hormones were uh, significantly out of whack and the doctor did some, gave me some medicine to adjust it and now i'm more stable because i got to be very emotional over the last few years i was thinking i actually thought that I had matured so much that I became a very sensitive man. I would get real emotional and choked up all the time, even tear up. And, and uh, I thought, wow, I guess I'm, I've really um, matured. I, I'm really sympathetic and have these feelings. And then once they corrected my, my hormones, now I'm kind of cold hearted. I'm just like my, my was normally. And I, I, I realized, wait a second. It's not that I was just a sensitive, nice person. It's just that my hormones were not right. So a lot of who we are is, is the way that our, our brains and hormones work. And uh, that's what, what I was pointing at making is that laughing and smiling are really good for our, our health. And it, it, it's not only a psychological thing, but you actually get chemical reactions going on in your body as a result of laughing and smiling. So try it now, everybody. If you're watching this now, just raise the corners of your mouth <laughs> like that. You want, you can't help it. You immediately get happy. <laughs> All right, brother. What do you think of that? Oh, wow, brother Luke. I highly recommend that to uh, all your listeners. Okay. Cause that's uh, born out of pure wisdom and success. Uh, very good. I hope you've documented this, uh, uh, the instructions, everything you just said somewhere where we have quick access to it and we can share it uh, with a phone call. Hello. Guess what? I just laughed out loud. That's wonderful. God bless you, brother Luke. Okay. Back to you. All right. Thank you, brother. And I'll tell you, since I'm on this subject and sharing my thoughts and feelings here, that's one of the things that I like so much about you and enjoy being around you is because a lot of times you make me smile and laugh. And, and that's a wonderful thing to do for someone else is if you can make someone else smile, uh, it's a blessing you're giving them. Uh, I will go on now to the next verse, though. Um, this is verse uh, 14. It says, the mouth of strange women is a deep pit. He that is abhorred of the Lord shall fall therein. Wow. Tell you what, Solomon has written an awful lot in the Proverbs about the, 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 you know, beware of the strange woman and, you know, the bad things that happen. What, what is a strange woman anyway, as he, you know, this term strange woman? Well, now a strange woman could be a, a, a false religion. A strange woman could be a, a woman of another nationality. Or uh, maybe there's others. What do you say, Brother Luke? Well, uh, brother, you have a wife, and I have a wife, and any other woman be, apart from my wife would be a strange woman. Another woman besides your wife, uh, particularly if we take it to a step further, it's a woman who's a stranger. Um, uh, and it's the, the warning is that if you are going to be with someone apart from your wife, another woman, this the term is a strange woman, then uh, you're just asking for trouble. Your life can be ruined from it. And I, uh, I know that I, uh, many years ago, probably even before I was a Christian, I used to watch that show, Jerry Springer. It's a crazy show, but the, the type of guests that he had on the show, I don't know if the show's even still in the air. I think it might be, but 
the kind of guests that they have on that show is typically this is what happens. You have um, a man who's uh, married to, and he has a wife, and 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 the man is sleeping with his wife's sister, or uh, a, a man is sleeping with his uh, his stepmother. He, his he, he, his father has a, married again, and the son is sleeping with the step stepmother. That's the kind of thing that they talk about on the Jerry Springer show. That's the typical situation, and they all want to talk about it and argue about it. And, uh, but a lot of times, I, I notice that these people say, well, we couldn't help it. It just happened. And I've always thought that was just absolutely absurd because what happened, What if, if you want to know something that just happens is, you know, I, I slipped on a banana peel and fell down on and, and, and f on my butt and, and hurt my hip. That's something that just happens. But you never slip on a banana peel, fall down, and discover that you're in intercourse with a woman. You know, adultery doesn't just happen. In order for a, for a, a, a intercourse to be uh, uh, entered into, uh, many doors have to be walked through. First, the door of, you know, the glance, and then the flirtation, the conversations, the seduction, then the planning, and then the preparing, and then the following through. And does this sound, does this sound like uh, maybe I know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I'm guilty. I, I've done this in the past, so I know how it works. It's a, a many doorways that you have to go through before you find out you're in that final position of intercourse. You don't just like slip on a banana and find out you're having intercourse. So the excuse that people say that, well, hey, it just happened, is just a bunch of BS. And so, but so we have all these warnings throughout Proverbs. If we do a word search, strange woman, you'll probably have that term appear up, appear almost exclusively in Proverbs. And I bet you that term appears, you know, 20 times or 50 times or more. We have all these warnings about avoid the strange woman because there's just nothing but nothing but trouble that comes from getting involved with another woman besides your wife. Brother, you have anything to share on this? Uh, yeah, Brother Luke, uh, scriptures was uh, saying, uh, in our last uh, hangout, that that sin is heinous, and heinous a uh, pretty strong word. Okay, uh, but I think I might be a greater sinner than you, brother Luke. Okay, back to you. Yeah. Every time I start talking about or thinking about my life, you know, I just make me even more thankful for our great Savior, Jesus. All right. Um, let me go on to the next verse. It's uh, verse 15. It says, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Oh, man. <laughs> well, I remember that uh, uh, my mother, uh, she died in December of 1986, December 6th. Actually, this is, uh, that, that date's coming up in a couple of days. What is today, anyway? This today is uh, the third. So in three days, it'll be the 29th anniversary of my mother's death and when my mother died that was the catalyst for me to get life she died i got life because when she died uh, no one in my family had died before that point i never had to confront the question of what happens after we die what's the purpose of life anyway 
and it made me think and I needed answers. So I started seeking and I got my answers from the Bible. But uh, when that happened, that was uh, 29 years ago now. Um, in December, December of 1986 is when I got saved. But when I think back about my mother, uh, she used to switch on me a lot in a belt when I was a little boy. And I mean, I guess from the time I was, I guess, I don't know, remember when I was like five or six or seven or something, I was, I was always doing something wrong, like tormenting my little sister somehow. Or, and so a lot of times my mother would say uh, to my sister, go get me a switch from the tree. And my sister would be real happy to go get a switch off the tree so my mother could spank me or go get my belt. And my sister would say, can I get the big belt, mommy? Can I get the big belt? <laughs> My sister, I have a lot of fun talking about that now, but uh, uh, I was not spared the switch and the stick and the rod and, you know, and uh, I, I know I, I, I deserved it, but uh, these kids, there's a lot of people that have children, they're absolutely out of control and their foolishness, their f little foolish children, if they don't get disciplined, that fool, you need to spank the foolishness out of them. And I don't mean abuse them, but spanking them enough so that they learn their lesson and you're not injuring them. They don't have to go to the hospital or anything like that. But I know it, it helped me. And it is, it is, the Bible tells us that's the way you, you, you're a good parent if you discipline your children. How about you, brother? Were you spanked as a little boy? And have you, did you ever spank your children? Well, brother Luke, uh, yes, absolutely. And, uh, Thank God for it. Uh, thank God for that verse. Uh, it gives us great insight uh, into the proper rearing of our children uh, because uh, you don't want to kill the kid, but you do want to uh, discipline him so he doesn't uh, do anything that's going to harm himself or others. Okay, uh, back to you. I, I, unfortunately, I, I, I've got a family and friends that have children, and now because of my age, you know, my friends, they're my age, and their children are grown. And some of my fam, my friends, their children are just outstanding, and just like my sons, outstanding. And just we have nothing but happiness and pride about over, uh, you know, the, their character and how they've turned out. Uh, but then I, I know some other people had their, their children have been disasters. And uh, we think that if we're lenient and we're, we, well, we love them. We don't want to punish them, discipline because we love them. But you're not doing your child a favor being lean, too lenient. Uh, because this is how they learn that there are rules in, in life and there's consequences for breaking your rules. And they can learn by getting a swat on the butt. And maybe a little bit of a welt on their butt or something. Nothing bad, but but that's how they learn. There's rules. This is the consequence for breaking the rule. If they don't learn that as a child, what happens? As they grow older, they start breaking the rules of society, which are called laws. And the law has consequences when you break it. And they, some of these people I know, their children are in prison. They're in jail. Their, their lives are totally screwed up because they didn't learn to follow rules as a child. And therefore, as they grew up, they weren't following the laws of the society. Okay, I'm going to go on unless you want to add something to that. I'd like to say, Brother Luke, it usually just takes one time. Uh, I just had to do it one time with all my kids. Okay, back to you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, I'll read it in the, in the uh, Amplified, and then we'll move to the next verse. It says, Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of discipline that's correction administered with godly wisdom and loving kindness, will remove it far from him. Okay, now we go to verse 16 in the KJV. He that oppresseth the poor to increase his riches, and he that giveth to the rich shall surely come to want. Well, I know you can explain that one to me, brother. Verse 16. 
Uh, there's no need for an explanation, Brother Luke. Uh, Jewish bankers. Okay, back to you. <laughs> Uh, okay, um, I'm going to read it in the Amplified. It, it does seem pretty, uh, pretty straightforward to understand. Verse 16 in the Amplified says, He who oppresses or exploits the poor to get more for himself, or who gives the, to the rich to gain influence and favor, will only come to poverty. Um, the only problem with your example, I think that... Um, I mean, it, it, people may really consider what you said and, and the fact that I'm not arguing against it, that we're really bigoted against Jewish people. Um, but, and, and maybe I am to a certain extent. I, uh, I, I, I would never deny friendship to someone because they're Jewish. I would never deny them uh, the gospel I would want to share the gospel with them as much as anybody else. Um, but the, the, the Jews in the Bible are denounced over and over and over again throughout the whole Bible for, for their rejection of God. Continue over and over again. They are going off to other gods and, and they're, they're called stiff-necked and stubborn people. And uh, so even though on some hand, in, in, in some ways, we find these great people in the Bible who at a certain point there, there we start starts talking about Jews. But the Jews, Adam was not a Jew. Um, Noah was not a Jew. Um, um, we don't get, uh, even Abraham was not a Jew. He, his son was uh Isaac and Ishmael, his two sons. And then the son that the promise went to was uh, Isaac. And, and he, he then he had two sons, Jacob and Esau. And the promise from God to Abraham passed down to um, Jacob. But um, even Jacob was not really... Maybe, maybe he, we could say Jacob was the first Israelite because his name was changed to Israel. God changed Jacob's name to Israel. So maybe we could say Jacob was the first Israelite. But then Jacob had 12 sons, one of which was named Judah. And his 12 sons are called the 12 tribes of Israel. So all of his descendants were Israelites. But one particular son, his family, were from Judah, and they were called the Jews. Um, so when we talk about the Jewish people, you know, if we're going to be technical and really understand it, uh, those are the Jewish people. So most of the Bible is not talking about the Jewish people at all. And yet uh, God does talk about, uh, you know, uh, the Jewish people in some very negative way, terms. And, and uh, even though through them, we get the Messiah. And Jew, Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. He came from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Jesse, David, and that was his family line. So he came from the tribe of Judah. And so he was Jewish. Uh, so we have some great uh, uh, characters in the Bible who are heroes that were Jewish. But then we also have the Bible very, very critical of the Jewish people too. So when you joke that this verse here is about Jewish bankers, uh, you know, um, well, you're not the only one that, that uh, you know, talks about the, the Jewish people in a negative way. And, and also, we, we do know that uh, the Jewish people have uh, been very successful. It's a tiny little fraction of the population of the world. And yet, the amount of wealth that they own compared to the rest of the world is, is way out of proportion. So why is that? Is it because they're the smartest people or the best at, at running businesses and, and making money. Uh, I don't know. I'm not going to try to explain all that. I'm not sure I understand it uh, perfectly anyway. Uh, but so your statement here, on one hand, it sounded like a bigoted statement. But on the other hand, uh, even sometimes bigoted statements and stereotypes. A stereotype 
only develops into a stereotype because it's repeated so often because it's generally accepted as a, as a, a truism about a group of people. Um, so, all right, well, that's how I'm trying to explain your, your horrible remark. <laughs> Just kidding, brother. Okay, what do you want to say before we move on? Oh, you're absolutely right, Brother Luke. There may be people out there that will get offended uh, when we talk like that. Our, our weaker brethren, we call them, right? Now, that's my doctrine of the weaker brethren. I would love to bring that up to you right now because I just offended them. Now, what I must do is make it up to them because we hold the weaker brethren in highest regard according to scriptures okay so uh if, if they would just contact me the lone ranger and uh we'll get going on those reparations uh okay back to you all right i'm going to move on now to verse the next verse is uh verse 17 bow down thine ear and hear the words of the wise and apply thine heart unto knowledge well, obviously, that's what the whole book of Proverbs is, is, is you know, when we, we decide to read and study the book of Proverbs, this is the whole approach that we're supposed to take. Bow down, down thine ear and hear the words of the wise and apply thine heart unto my knowledge. Uh, let me read that in the Amplified. Listen carefully and hear the words of the wise and apply your mind to my knowledge. But you, you want to add anything to that? I would like to add verse number 18 because it continues on for it is a pleasant thing if thou keep them within thee they shall withal be fitted in thy lips okay that makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. oh it continues into verse 19 you want to go ahead and pick that one up yeah okay uh, 19 that thy trust may be in the Lord I have made known to thee this day even to thee have not I written to thee excellent things and counsels and knowledge that I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send unto thee I think all of those verses go together I'm going to read it in in uh, flowing uh, uh, in the amplified um, it says, uh, starting with verse 17, uh, listen carefully and hear the words of the wise and apply your mind to my knowledge, for it will be pleasant if you keep them in mind, incorporating them as guiding principles. Let them be ready on your lips to guide and strengthen yourself and others so that your trust and reliance and confidence may be in the Lord. I have taught these things to you today, even to you. I have not written to you excellent things in counsels and knowledge to let you know the certainty of the words of truth that you may give a correct answer to him who sent you. Okay. It's, yeah. So uh, that's pretty easy to understand. It's just uh, saying, hey, uh, Solomon starts off the whole book of Proverbs and he says more than once, he says, I'm writing these things to teach my son wisdom. And uh, this wisdom is a wonderful thing. Uh, the book, uh, is it Ecclesiastes or Song of Solomon that has a chapter talking about uh, There's a there's a, a chapter a section in there where people the Jehovah's Witnesses want to apply it to Jesus to to show that he's he's not eternal and uh, but it, in terms of, but it's really talking about wisdom it's not talking about Jesus at all it's about wisdom uh, I don't remember exactly where it is I think it might be in Song of Solomon uh, but this wisdom is. Um, one of the greatest things I, I would say well paul ranks them he says love is above all things 
Um, it, it was first Corinthians 15, no, first Corinthians chapter seven. Is that the love chapter, chapter seven? Uh, but he, Paul talks about all these different qualities. Um, no, it's 13. 13, yeah. 13. Isn't it? Well, it's either 13 or seven. I don't remember. I think seven is the one about marriage. Yeah, seven's marriage and, and 13 is love. And, uh, but he talks about all these things that, uh, you know, we, we want to have, all these qualities, including faith. And, uh, and, but he says, above all things is love. KJV uses the word charity. Uh, but um, as you always go back to this, uh, the royal law of love, and, uh, and that's what Jesus says also. He, he, he says there's two things. Um, you know, you, you believe in him and, and you love each other. You, tr you trust God, you love God, and then you love each other. This, it's really, the Bible can be kind of summed up in that way. Uh, so this idea of getting wisdom is so important. The only thing more important, of course, would be faith in Jesus and loving your fellow man. But wisdom is very powerful. And that's what these verses here are telling us, that how, how wonderful it is and how we should be seeking it. And it even says at one point in one of the earlier chapters, it's, it's much more valuable than silver and gold and precious gems if you, if you have wisdom. All right, brother, let me see if I think that's a good place to stop. Uh, let me see. That was. Uh, verse 21. Yeah, verse 21. Uh, verse 22 is where we'll pick up next time here. I'm going to write that down. Proverbs 22, 22. All right, that's where we'll go next time. All right. Uh, we have uh, saved a few minutes here in the end so that we can tell people about the thing that's even more important than wisdom. And it, in a way, it, it is uh, part of wisdom. It's the most important wisdom that you'll ever, ever uh obtain and that's what the apostle paul calls wisdom unto salvation i mean you could be wise about the world and you know make all kinds of good decisions in your life about your health and about business and about family and relationships and, and your wife life is full of wisdom and then you die and you don't get to go to heaven because you weren't wise enough to trust Jesus. <laughs> so we certainly want to tell you about wisdom unto salvation. Um, the, in, in all my videos, uh, in the description box, I post my statement of faith, and, and I also post below that um, a series of verses. And I, I, and I say, uh, copy these, uh, and then and then print them up and then pass it out like a Bible tract. And and one of the ver verses that the first verse, of course, I start off with is, is Romans ten three, because this explains the the, the problem in the, that exists in the world. And uh, a lot of people think that the problem in the world that has to be resolved is sin. They think, well, if I can if I can stop sinning and be a good person, then that's what I need to do to go to heaven. But in Romans 10, 3, you know, it, it tells us, no, this is the problem. The problem is man is trying to obtain salvation by, by uh, uh, um, developing his own righteousness. But it says that's not God's way. You, can't, you cannot get into heaven based upon your own righteousness. So if you think that uh, if you can just control your sin, and, and stop sinning and then start doing good things that you die and then God says, oh, they did good. They really did good. So I'm going to let them into heaven. Uh, well, I've got, I've got news for you. That's not God's way. The Bible says God's way 
is to trust Jesus for your salvation. Don't try to get into heaven through personal merit. So, but this concept of personal merit and, and earning heaven, going to heaven as a reward for your good behavior. That is the philosophy that we see all around the world today and all throughout the history of man. That's been the predominant philosophy of the world. All the religions of the world are based on this one idea that heaven is a reward for good behavior. The good people get to go to heaven. The bad people don't go to heaven. They go to hell instead. So you need to understand if you want to uh, understand what the Bible says about salvation, what we call biblical Christianity, not the kind of Christianity you find in most churches, not the kind of Christianity that you find in the Roman Catholic Church, but the kind of Christianity that we get from a Bible. And it says that uh, in, Rome, in Ephesians 2, chapter 8 and 9, it says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So it, if it, Romans 10, 3 tells us that you can't go to heaven by establishing your own righteousness. Instead, you need to put your faith in Jesus and, and receive his righteousness. And then Ephesians 2, 8, 9 tells us that uh, salvation uh, is because God is gracious and because we have faith in Jesus. And it says it's not because we work our way to heaven and earn it. It's salvation's a gift that God offers us and, and if we'll put our faith in Jesus. So that's really what you need to understand, that uh, um, there, there's a word that a lot of people use, and it's really misused a lot by, by the world. That's, the word is gospel. It shouldn't be that understood, misunderstood because it, it simply translated to mean good news. The gospel means good news. And, and the good news is that salvation is a free gift Jesus offers to everyone. If you'll trust him to get you into heaven, if you rely on him, depend on him, put your confidence in him, reject the idea that you're going to get to heaven through your own efforts and instead rely on Jesus, that he gives you heaven as a free gift. Isn't that wonderful? That should make you happy. That should make you smile. Uh, but uh, who is Jesus? Uh, that's important to understand. The Bible says that Jesus is eternal God Almighty who became a man. It says he, he was made flesh and lived among us. And it, it says that he became a man so that he could die for our sins. And you know, you've heard about the cross, the crucifixion. Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins. And he was successful. All the sins of all mankind throughout all of history were put on Jesus on that cross. So, the, see, if you think that the issue between you and God today is sin, and if you can just stop sinning, you're going to be okay with God, that's wrong. Jesus already paid for all our sins, so sin is not the issue. It's Salvation is not a sin issue. It is a son issue. The issue is the Son of God. What will you do with the Son of God, Jesus Christ? Will you trust him? or try to fix yourself up and make yourself spotless and clean so God will accept you? You can try it if you want, but the Bible says it's impossible to get to heaven through your own merit. It says if you if you want to do it, you have to be perfect, and here's perfection, and nobody reaches it. Everybody falls short, it says. So Jesus died for our sins, and then he, after three days in the tomb, he raised himself from the dead. Now, that is really important because um, the Jews, during Jesus' ministry, from the beginning to the end, he did miracles. They kept on demanding a sign because Jesus made these outlandish claims. He says, the Father and I are one. If you see me, you've seen the Father. He claimed to be God. They wanted to stone him because of his claims that he's God. 
And he also claimed that you can't get into heaven except through him. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. What would you think if someone made those claims to you today? They said, I'm God, and you, you need me to get into heaven. You might think they're crazy. You might think they're some kind of a liar, or you could believe their claims. Well, they didn't believe Jesus' claims. They prove it. Give us a sign. Jesus said, uh, the sign I'll give you is destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. He was talking about his body. They thought he was talking about the temple in Jerusalem. And he, he asked him again for a sign. He says, the only sign I'll give you is the sign of Jonah. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. He was speaking about his death, burial, and resurrection. So he said, the sign I will give you is I'll die, be buried, and raise myself back to life. That way I'll prove to you my claims. I'm God, I'm the Savior. And he did it. He raised himself from the dead. He walked on the earth, resurrected for 40 days among 500 witnesses. They saw him, they talked with him, they spoke with him, they ate with him, they touched him. And that resurrection is what proves to me that his claims are true and that his promise of eternal life to me is, is true. So I, I hope you'll put your faith in Jesus now and uh, receive the gift of eternal life. Okay, brother, uh, I know that uh, you've heard this message a thousand times probably, but do you want to make any comment on that before we close? Well, Brother Luke, we need to get this message out. Uh, there's not enough workers, and there's too many false doctrines uh, preaching otherwise. Let's pray right now real quick that the Lord of the harvest will send more workers into the harvest. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for our sins and being buried and rising again the third day. We receive it. Now, Lord Jesus, send more workers into the harvest so we can reap these souls for the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, Brother Eric, thanks again for joining me tonight. And uh, uh, viewers, uh, uh, join us uh, nightly at 7 p.m. Pacific time. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.